Good morning all. I don't know if you can hear me. We're going to make a, make a start now. Um, very warm welcome. Really good to see you today. Um, I've been actually quite excited about today because uh, I think some of the subjects that we're going to cover are really, really helpful. Um, I noticed, I've even got, a, there's even a clock up here now, so I haven't got to struggle with my, with the timings, which is great. We'll soon find out whether I remember to look at the clock. Yeah, so should we just, um, should we just pray? Father God, I want to thank you that we, uh, together, have been able to put this time aside today to understand more about growth. We thank you that you've designed things, all life, to grow and to expand. And that we ask today that as we um, look at some of the principles of growth for ourselves and for our churches, we'll be at work helping us just to take hold of the things that are for us today. We thank you that you're good. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And we ask for your presence today in a tangible way through our conversations and our thinking. Amen. Great. So... Um, some, something's a little bit different today. You, you probably noticed there's tea and coffee on a table at the back, which was an experiment last time we met. That experiment has worked, and you can help yourself to tea and coffee any time. We will be having a specific coffee break, 11-ish, 11 11-15-ish or something, but you're welcome if you get a bit thirsty. Please do help yourselves um, at the back. So briefly, what are we covering today? We're going to cover... Um, the law of design, which is um, about, well, Sharon will be introducing this, it's about how having design in our minds as we approach personal growth can be a really, really good thing. We can map out how we'd like to grow. And that could be true as a church as well. Um, and at the end of today's session, so Sharon will be doing design at the beginning, at the end, Andy will be explaining how we can use some of those principles of design to come up with uh, a plan as a church. And then next week, next month rather, we'll be feeding back, after we've met in small groups as a church um, afterwards, feeding back what, we're going to, what our plan is, what our design is, if you like. Okay, so that's a map of the beginning and the end. Then in the middle, I'll be talking about the law of trade-offs. It's a very simple law, but a really powerful one. I, I found it incredibly powerful, um, which is simply you've got to give up to grow up. And there's lots of really, really practical stuff in there, which um, I'm hoping will be helpful to you as it has been to me. Now, Mandy's going to um, just join us now. Mandy is going to just um, look back at some of the exercises that you were doing last time. Um, and just have a discussion around that. Thank you very much, Mandy. Thank you, Neb. It's really lovely to be back. I missed a, a couple of sessions. Angela has been here. She sends her love. She's actually at General Synod this weekend, so if you remember her in your prayers, she would really appreciate that. Um, it's not an easy thing to go and discuss difficult topics with people that you don't know very well, so yeah, please do pray for her. Uh, I've done my homework because I've not been here for a couple of sessions, so... I've gone back and watched the videos and, you know, brushed up on some of the terminology of the different laws. Um, I don't know about you, but I have to wrestle with some of those titles just to make sure that I've understood. I got a bit confused between design that we're going to look at today and navigation. And I think I'm right, Neville correct us if I'm not, that navigation is to do with external, there's a goal, how do I get from here to there? And design is to do with the internal me stuff. It's like the engine of the ship rather than the course the ship is steering. Is that right? Is that Roughly right. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> so that sounds really good. Um, I tend to do, a, because I'm a bit of a reflector, I do tend to do a lot of inner wrestling with stuff. Um, but a couple of things that struck me as I was doing my homework is, you know, all of these laws, 
capture such a lot of wisdom in, in such a, a small amount of words. Sometimes we need to unpack them. Um, but the thing that struck me was if, this is, if these are true, if these have really got weight on them, that we can stand on them, then that's a real challenge, isn't it? Because we've got to take that seriously and, and think about what difference that's going to make in our lives. I, I personally have to start to think, well, what, what am I going to do differently now if this is true? Am I going to take this seriously and put it into practice? How am I going to change? And change is a bit uncomfortable, <laughs> at least for me. Um, and in particular, empowerment, which you thought about last time, I thought I'd share a little story about how I had a real penny-dropping moment around empowerment uh, over the last couple of years. I'm, I'm, I did one of these spiritual gift-type questionnaires once, and, and there were about 24 different things that God could gift you in to serve the church. And my top score, I was expecting it to be teaching, because I do a lot of teaching. That's what, you know, I've got a lot of experience in. It wasn't teaching, that was second. It was helps. I'm just a born helper. And, I, and when I saw that, I thought, well, actually, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm, I'm the person that, that people ask for help with stuff. You know, I just, because I get on and do it, I just, you know, I'm a yes person, really. If somebody asks me um, for help, then I give it. But the thing, the penny-dropping moment in terms of empowering others was how much helping others can get in the way of that. Because it's easier for me to do it than to actually teach them to do it and then trust that they'll do it well. Um, I really had to wrestle with when is it the right thing, the Good Samaritan thing, you know, there's a crisis situation and you have to step in and help. There's no question about it. And there are definitely situations like that. But then there are these other situations, like, like when Jesus healed... Um, the blind man, and he sent him off. He put mud on his eyes. I don't know if you remember the story. And he sent him off to the pool of Siloam to wash the mud himself. How, you know, I really wrestled with that and thought, well, Jesus could have sure touched him and healed him. But he didn't. He invited the man to work with him in his own healing. And I, I wonder what would have happened if he'd gone to a different pool. You know, would it have still worked? Maybe he would have got partial sight back. It wouldn't have quite been the right full vision restoration? I have no idea. But that thing that I was wrestling with in thinking about when do I step in and take over and do the stuff that I know I can do, and when do I just get alongside someone, do a bit, let them do a bit, and slowly, and that's really uncomfortable. I find that so uncomfortable. Even as a mum, you know, you know, if you always tie your kids' shoelaces, they're never going to learn how to do it for themselves, are they? It's the same kind of principle, I think, in church. You know, sometimes actually doing something with someone and then letting them slowly do a bit more, you do a bit less, makes me feel really uncomfortable. Not because I think I can do it better, just because I like helping. And I'm not helping if I'm stepping back. And so am I doing the right thing? It's, that's the kind of self-talk that goes on in my head. So you were all asked... What are you, where are you empowering well? Um, what, when, does it, when can you see that that's working, that you're helping someone to flourish and grow? And when can you do it better? So I'm going to take the microphone off and kind of come round and see if somebody can feed back from each group those two things. Anyone want to go first? Okay. Okay, so when we met, we talked about um, what we did already. Um, and we said that we do, um, uh, do you know, actually um, help people grow, feel valued, and being loved. And there's different things that we actually do within this, our church. It's like we've got something called St. John's on stage. Literally, you know, that's our pantomime and our theatre group. We've got Eco Church, we've just got the Bronze Award, so that was actually empowering someone else to, well, work alongside you really as well, wasn't it? The, the, work. <laughs> the Rotor Organisation, Father has nothing to do with the Rotor, so it's actually all organised. Coffee mornings, like today's our coffee morning, so, and that's all organised within a team. 
um, and say oh, we've got some external theatre groups as well that we actually, and again, Father has nothing to do with that, do you? <laughs> Do you want me to go on about what, how we, um, so um, do we, well we said about over in power and there's a lot of people that are doing lots of good things at St John's um, and stewardship is part of our empowering, this is our new campaign that we're actually doing at the moment um, and we were just like thinking because there are certain people that do maybe a bit too much and they really need to kind of like let go and like we were trying to think about different ways of actually helping that and we said about shadowing a po possibility as well um, and getting feedback from other people and obviously how do we support each other and we said about mission and what's really best for the church really so. that's great thank you sounds like there's some really exciting things already happening um, and that helping people to let go um, we're going to revisit that again today in this trade-offs. When, when is it right for people to put something down and when is it right for them to stay with it and keep, keep hold of it? Um, there's a trade-off there, isn't there? And that, one of the costs of that can mean that somebody else isn't empowered if you decide to stay with it. Shall I come over here? Thank you. So we've got a lot of talent in our congregations, people who can bake, who do craft activities, who are good with kids. And so we've got a lot of events that go on, such as Messy Church and other kids' events. Um, we put on afternoon teas. Um, we put on sort of like um, musical concerts and that. Um, and recently, because we've had a f whole fundraising push to try and get some new sort of heating and help our church to go green, there's been a lot of different activities, and we've even got some people from who's I say sort of the slightly outside the fringes of the community as well who've been getting involved. So we, I think, as a church, we do really well to sort of use some of the skills and talents that we've got. However, I think we could do, well, we've noticed that this fundraising activity has given a bit more of a focus. So whereas we've sort of had a bit of an issue, I say, with sort of trying to get people involved and get volunteers and trying to get people motivated, actually having this focus has really helped with people. Um, and also there has been a bit of a, um, uh, uh, I suppose, a, um, a battle with sort of people have been like, there's a, an it's always been done this way type of attitude as well in the church. So sort of trying to say, actually, well, why don't we think about doing things a new way, a different way? And so we've sort of been trying to um, empower people, but I think we could do a little bit more to try and empower people well through that. Yeah, I think that's a really massive issue is navigating change. If you know that you're here and this is actually working okay, but you can see how it could be so much better it's much safer to stay with okay, isn't it? And then you lose possibility of it being exceptional. Or it's, it's <laughs> we've got a pear tree in our garden. We get one pear every year. And every year I do this reading to think out what I need to do differently to try and boost the fruit. You know, I've not got there yet. But I, if I gave up and just resigned myself to the one pear, that would be so much easier. But I'd probably be failing the tree. I need a beehive. Wow. I'll have to have a conversation about that. <laughs> okay. Who's, who would like to feed back? I guess, um, yeah, we've been a church where um, sort of social events and outreach events have kind of like happened ad hoc. It's very difficult for people to be involved and recognize their gifts and you know but we have started now sort of bringing people together as a, a coordination group so that sort of you know chat about ideas and i've asked that group of people to look outwards so that we can actually draw other people in so that we can use their gifts so it's sort of a bit like a, a ripple effect and i've done the same for the pastoral work as well we sort of meet regularly so it's not just us doing the pastoral visits and whatever we're actually using the gifts of the people in the congregation not everybody's part of that group that are pastoral but we sort of again reach out to um, various people to get them on board and and again like it's just been said it's about sort of uh, breaking old habits i think and um, getting people to see that things can be differently, done differently, and other people can do things. You know, it's about let, letting, getting other people to let go in order that other people can 
get hold of. And I think for us, because we've drawn two congregations together, that's even more important because we want to make sure that people from the Old St. Andrew's congregation who are part of our congregation are involved as well and that they're enabled to use their gifts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that highlights a really interesting point as well that um, when when new people join, if there's no space for them to start getting involved and taking on responsibility because everybody's happy in the jobs that they're doing, nobody wants to give anything up, that can make it really hard for those new people to feel welcome and part of the church and appreciated for what they're bringing and contributing. So um, it's another thing to wrestle with. Um, I read something recently about the difference between children and adults and learning that children pick things up a lot quicker than adults. And I think that's because adults have to do a lot more work with all the stuff they already know, our past experiences of what's worked, perhaps well and perhaps not so well. And how does this new information we're being told impact on that? That takes time. And setting aside a time like this to do that work together is really, really valuable. Um, What's happening next, Nev? Okay, um, we can flick over. They're, they're going to go live in any time now, I think. Okay, so, okay. Thank I'll you sit so down much. then. Thank you. A little anecdote there. That's great. So, relation, you know, building relationship is also really important, isn't it? And that re relationality. So, as leaders, it's not great just to go and grab somebody and say, can you come and do this? But just to get to know people, be alongside them. And uh, that also builds confidence. It builds confidence in you as a leader as well, so that they, they know that they're going to get that level of support and care in it too. Are they with us? We've hit the time when we said we would <laughs> switch. The revised time we said, we said we'd switch. So um, we'll just wait for a thumbs up from Wakefield. Um, so if you need to stand and stretch, feel free to do that. Um, and as soon as you've got Wakefield, you know, paying attention. Um, Adam, if we can go on the live on the link, that will be helpful. And if I can have my slides on the screen, that will be even more helpful. I, well, I said, I, when I said stretch, I didn't say get more coffee. God. But you guys can if you want to. Okay, so apparently we're with us. So good morning, Wakefield. I hope that things are going very well there. We've just had some very encouraging feedback and particularly reflecting back on um, how we offer support alongside challenge. Um, so it, we're going to be thinking this morning about two new laws which we've talked about on the videos which some of you have watched this morning and others may have watched beforehand as well. Um, so we're thinking first of all about the law of design um, how we maximize growth, and then after coffee, we'll be thinking about the law of trade-off and how we give up to grow up. I'm particularly thinking about how we apply both of these things to ourselves and our churches. These are laws of personal growth rather than leadership, um, but they can apply for us individually and also for us in our churches. So I've had a couple of bits of feedback about my video um, about how come my garden is so far ahead of the rest of you. It's because I'm so far ahead of the rest of you in all kinds of different ways. Um, behind me, over the shoulder on the video, um, there's some trees that we planted um, a couple of years ago. This is not the tree. This is someone else's tree. Uh, and on the video, I talked particularly about the way in which God designs and asks you to uh, or invited you to look at Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, what we see is the way in which God creates the universe, and there's particularly ingredients that he puts into creation which ensures that life and growth happen. And particularly, what we see is let there be light, the separation of land and water, and as a result of the light, there is temperature. And if all of those ingredients are in place and there's a good seed there, the tree has no chance to do anything other than what? I love it when the tech works. So 
So God designs creation with a healthy environment for growth. But if you take away any one of those items, what happens? Let's take the water out. So there is drought. What's going to happen? The tree has no choice. It can do anything but. The tech works even more. It's a slow death. <laughs> there are sad stories of all of these wonderful schemes about how we are planting new trees to offset our carbon, but we're doing it in such a way that the trees don't actually survive. Yeah, we need to think very carefully about this in terms of how we create good environments for, uh, for creation. The point is that all of those things need to be there in the design. If you miss one out, it doesn't work. Years ago, I used to work in the motor industry. Let's imagine you design a great engine. One of the things I worked on. You put the pistons there, the spark plugs there, the fuel supply in there. What I worked on was the software which made it work. Take the software out, the engine just sits there. It doesn't know what to do. It's all part of the design. All the ingredients need to be there. And what we see in the way in which God designs is a number of different things. There's making sure that all of the ingredients are there. I had a great cup of coffee this morning because all the ingredients were there. A great cup of coffee with cold water. How is that a great cup of coffee? It's not, is it? You need to have all of the ingredients there. And God designs those in. Another thing that God does, the way in which he designs, it ensures that there is both multiplication and succession. This amazing thing that, you know, every time I cut open a pepper, there's all these seeds inside. I have to kind of, you know, get... I don't want to eat them, you know, so they end up in the compost. Who knows what happens after that. But God designs all these things with seeds inside. And one of the things that's really important, the things that we design in our own lives, and particularly in our church lives, is that we design with succession in mind. We'll think a bit more about that in our next session. As a friend of mine kept saying to me, there is no success without a successor. If we start something amazing and then we decide to move on, does it all fall apart because we've moved out? Or is there succession, which means that the good stuff carries on? And if it's good in one place, can we multiply it so it happens in other places as well? God designs creation with seeds inside. And God designs with amazing variety and, frankly, excess. You know, excess is one of those things we can have a bit of a strop about, stamp our feet and say, that's a bit excessive, Andy. God designs with amazing excess. Why were there so many seeds in that pepper that I cut open? I mean, frankly, to get one more pepper, surely one seed is enough. But there's hundreds. Why does God do that? And part of the key around variety is that we need that in creation. So when the climate changes, some of that variety will thrive more in a new environment while others will not thrive as well. And so things continue. As we design things in our churches, are we sufficiently flexible? Or are we just doing one thing? And if that goes wrong, it doesn't work. How many pathways can we offer to people that they can explore faith? Do we want a position where we say, well, our next seeker course will be next January, and now is February, so if you'd like to come back next January, that's when we do it. It's not a very good message, is it? Let's design variety into how people can explore faith, not just one size that fits all. And God designs with time. 
I'm not a very patient man. That's my family. That's the only one who knows me. Am I a patient man? I'm, I'm trying to learn, you know. When I planted this tree which was over my shoulder on the video, it didn't look very good for that after, after a week. It didn't look very good after a month. Three years on, I'm thinking, that tree's way out of control. <laughs> it's huge now. Part of design is recognizing that things take time to grow. We aren't born fully grown and mature, are we? As in human beings, we take time to grow. Human beings take a very long time to grow to adulthood and maturity. So patience is part of the way in which God designs. We see that in some degree in the, in the rhythm in Genesis 1. Evening came and morning came. Another day, which 1 Peter tells us might have been a thousand years or longer. But also what God's doing in that rhythm is God is looking and saying, oh, that's good. And that's review. And as we design things, let's just, not just make our minds do it. Let's check how things are going. You know, after six months, let's ask a question. How is it working out? Is that what we intended? Do we need to do some tweaks just to make sure that it's going to work out really well? And then on day six, God looks at creation with human beings there and goes, that's really good, very good. So at the end, we can say, yes, that's really good. So Sharon's going to come in a moment and just do a bit more on the law of design. But this is really, it builds on lots of the other laws that we've, that we've talked about. A lot of this is about environment. It's about intentionality. It's about a process that is not happening in a day. But I hope you can see that having all of the ingredients in place really matters. That thinking about succession and multiplication, how we can make this go further, is part of the way in which God designs. And he doesn't skimp. That variety and excess is part of the way in which God designs. So, all right, Sharon, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Fab. Yeah, the law of the design. Uh, you might, I don't know, maybe you didn't guess from the uh, video, but this is one of my favorite laws. <laughs> I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit big on strategies. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, uh, feeding of the 5,000. If you read it in Luke 9, why is that? Because Jesus said, Make them sit down in groups of about 50. And I love organized Jesus. Uh, I think Jesus encompasses all kinds of personality types. But I think there is an organized Jesus, uh, a Jesus that had a design and uh, a strategy for his ministry and the things that he was putting in place that I love to look at as I read the Gospels and see the journey uh, that he took over those three years of ministry. Do we think Jesus had a design? Did he know where he was going? Did he know how he was going to get there after three years? He had a big picture, and then he put stuff in place, not just for those three years, but for the succession planning and the legacy as well, getting the apostles alongside him and training them up. Jesus, I think, would have done a really good session on the law of design. But you've not got Jesus, you've got me. And uh, sorry about that. But this is what we're going to look at for the next uh, half an hour or so, the law of design. How many of you think that you live life in the conditional? I should have done more of that. I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I could have done X, Y, and Z. When you read, uh, if you've, I don't know if any of you have got the John Maxwell book, but when you read the chapter on the law of design, I was rereading it a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it tells this story where, well, it's his, it's his story. John Maxwell says his favorite um, day of the year is Christmas Day, and I was like, oh, I can relate to that. I love Christmas Day, and then he goes on to say that it's his favorite day because what he does is when sort of the main festivities are over, 
uh, in the day. He goes into his study and shuts the door and gets his diary out for the past year. And he spends the whole week between Christmas Day and New Year going through his diary from the last year, working out these questions. What should he have done more of? And what could he have done less of? What sort of things, which meetings went really well? And who did he have them with? And, you know, where, which areas of the work were not that fruitful and maybe he shouldn't have done? And I just, gosh, I, I, I'm not even sure how I would cope with somebody going off to do that <laughs> between Christmas. Because even though I love the law of design and I love strategies, if my husband did that for that year, that week between Christmas and New Year, I think we'd be entering more into the law of pain. And <laughs> wouldn't be good either. But I kind of get it. I get why he does it. Because everything we do requires our time. How are you using your time well? What would it look like for you, maybe just to have a little think for a minute, what would, it, what would it feel like for you to look back on your past year, on 2023? Would you be able to see those places within your work or your family life or your church life where you think, actually, I really thrived in that environment, that went well, Maybe I could do more of that. What would it look like to look back and think, do you know that just wasn't, that just didn't go well. Why did that not go well? I need to reflect on that, think through that. Maybe I need to design something a bit differently so that might go better if I have to do that again this year. Or even fun things like... I love those people. When they came round for dinner, we had a great evening back in July. Why haven't we done it since? So few of us organize our time well. And I think maybe so few of us as churches organize our time well as well. But sometimes we just... We let life happen to us rather than taking control for those things that help us to grow and flourish and have that sense of abundance and life in all its fullness. So the law of design, to maximize growth, develop strategies. So I asked you in the video to think about who you are, because I think there's a couple of key things that you need to understand about yourself in order to do design well. So did you manage to think about that? What your personalities are like? Uh, um, There's a whole other session on working that out. Come and talk to me if you need to do that. Let's have a hands up. You can do that in Wakefield as well. Uh, Who are the optimists in the room? Great. And uh, hands up all you pessimists. I think as pessimists, we're like, I don't want to put my hand up. It's all right, let's own it because it, you know, that it will influence how we do things. I think you, um, you remember I said in the video that I need, because I'm a bit of a pessimist, I need to make sure when I organize my days and my weeks that I have small wins in them so that I can go, I did that. Sometimes I write, I write a lot of lists. Sometimes I put things on my list that I know I've already done, then I can cross it off, then I can feel better about myself. <laughs> Marilyn, are we together on that? <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> uh, who's structured? I'm super structured. Who's unstructured? That's fine, we need all of us. Anybody task orientated? Where are our people, people? Lovely. We need you. We need you. Uh, Patient. Unpatient. (laughs) It's just good to know and to be really honest about that because it will affect these things around designing your life, which is about maximizing your time. I um, uh, had a day, I, I 
said I just needed a day on Thursday when I, I wasn't here in this building. I've got quite a lot of delivery to write. Uh, I can't write when I'm here. Uh, this is a busy place. And I knew I needed a day at home. I was like a kid in a sweet box. <laughs> I was like, I can have a day at home. But I knew that to get the best out of that day at home, I needed to have a plan for it. Uh, it wasn't a massively rigid plan because I knew I also needed to go easy on myself a bit. I had a meeting to fit in. I uh, had an email conversation earlier in the week with a person. If you remember on the video, I said, I'm, I'm better if I do reactive things in the morning. Uh, uh, the people stuff and answering emails. So I uh, decided that uh, we do morning prayer, nine to half past, we did that, and then I booked this meeting in for half past nine. I knew it'd just be half an hour, it was a Zoom, uh, and actually before morning prayer, I did some emails. So I knew that I could go boom, 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 emails, meeting, half past nine till 10 o'clock, and I knew that I'd be out of the way I'd feel better because that's how my brain and my uh, just who I am works. And then I had two sort of Bible study things I needed to prepare. I was like, I'm going to get the skeletons of those done in the morning because, again, they give me more life. I like writing those kind of things. And then in the afternoon, I needed to write a talk. And so I needed to read some books and do some study and look at the scriptures and, you know, think more prayerfully, do something that, that's a little bit more coming out of the middle of you. And I know I'm better at doing that later on in the afternoons. So do you get it? Do you know yourself well enough to be able to organize a day like that? Some of you are shaking your heads. And that's okay. If you're not a very structured person, you might find that. You might listen to me saying that and think you are a nutcase and I want to run out of this room. Because you, your brain doesn't work like that. But I am task-orientated and structured. But I also know that I'm a pessimist and I'm a bit impatient. And so I have to, I've learned how I need to work to get the most out of my time. Even if it feels uncomfortable, it, honestly, it is really worth thinking about clearly. Because otherwise, time just can disappear from us. Um, we're constantly in this life fighting against complexity. Our days are complex. Uh, our Families are often complex. Our work life, I think, is probably more complex than maybe it's been in the past. I think our churches are more complex. <laughs> There's a lot about our lives where we're fighting against complexity. Do you remember in the video I talked about um, understand, not just understanding yourself, but understanding your values and your priorities? Because that, if we understand the why we've got some stuff to do, then we're more likely to have the energy to take it on. We need to understand what's underpinning what we do. The why is really, really important. And then we need to understand what it is we've actually got to do, what's the plan? And then we need to work out the how and the when, which is the design and the strategy. So I think for me anyway, and I'd encourage you to do this too, understanding why you want to do something and then knowing what it is that you've got to do to make that happen and then work out the how and the when. How are you going to manage some of the decisions and the things that you need to do within your days? And we're going to put this on to church stuff as well in a minute too. So understanding what is it you want to do, what are the values that are underpinning that, the priorities? And then how are you going to put a strategy or a design in place 
to know how you're going to do it and when you're going to do it and what that's going to look like. So this is one way of trying to look at how we do this well. We need to think about, this is the, the value, the why thing really. What is the big picture? If there's something in your life, uh, so let's take something for example like um, uh, you, sleep. Something really, let's just do it as something really innocuous. So the big picture is uh, I'm not sleeping very well. It's uh, affecting how I'm uh, feeling about myself. It's affecting how I'm managing to do my work. Um, so the values and the priorities and the why is I'm just not functioning well because I'm not sleeping. The big picture thing is I need to work out how I'm going to sleep better. So you need to think about with the big picture of, of the whole thing and what is the end point? Where, where do you want to be? So it might be I'm going to give myself six months to try and work out how I'm going to sleep better. So decide what the time thing is and how are you going to do it. Now once you've done that, think about what priorities, what, what are your priorities in that? Um, I, I struggle a bit with priorities because I see everything as an opportunity. Is anybody else like that? I really struggle with priorities because I just, uh, if you do, if, when I've done Belbin, I come out quite strongly as a resource investigator. So I'm always like, oh, that's great. I'll take that. And that's a brilliant idea. I'll have that. And oh, there's a book I want to read. Uh, I'll buy that. And it's on my shelf. And I, I have all these things that, that I want to do because I see everything as an opportunity. Uh, so it's really important when we're designing and thinking, well, what's the priority? They are all good things. But what's the priority right now that feeds into the big picture? And that might change. You might work on one priority that feeds into the big picture and that begins to help and shift things and work and then there might become another priority. Um, again, I'm thinking of the sleep analogy. It might be that you think uh, so the priority is um, I need to shift stuff around in my bedroom. You know, it might be as simple as that. We, we've got some quite noisy neighbors. We had to move our bed to a different area of the room. That was a priority. Me, it meant some, you know, small thing, but it was a priority. And then you can move on to whatever the next thing is that feeds into the big picture. And then uh, you have to organize. Think, well, how am I going to do this? What do I need to put in place? So uh, it might be, again, if we're thinking about the sleep stuff, it might be uh, maybe you need to download a sleep app or um, make a decision. A lot of us make decisions about not having caffeine after a certain time, but it might be you need to buy yourself something else to drink, uh, chamomile or a milky drink or, you know, I'm just, I'm doing something fairly basic here, but you get what I mean? You need to organize. What do I need to put in place to make this stuff happen? And then to have an action bias and say, okay, so what, what am I going to do to kick this off and start? A sleep my app might help that. Uh, a lot of people in lockdown did the couch to 5K. Do you remember that? Sometimes you just need something that's got that action bias that gets you going. Uh, for other people, you need someone else to do it alongside you. You're not very good at doing stuff on your own. And maybe you've got another friend who's struggling to sleep and you do it together and you hold each other accountable. Or someone else to do that couch to 5K with you because you're not good at doing it on your own. 
So uh, having an action bias, what is going to get you going on this? How, is it, how are you going to sort of kick it off? Um, for me, I'm, I, I'm doing stuff with people does actually help me quite a lot. And then measurement. How are you going to evaluate how you're doing? So maybe, uh, again, for the sleep thing, you keep a sleep diary. Uh, diaries are really good for anything. Um, I, I'm just going to embarrass uh, Adam. We were talking, weren't we, uh, last week about keeping a time diary of how am I using my hours? Uh, am I doing too much? Do I need more time off? How am I going to plan my work and plan my time off better? Uh, actually physically writing some of this stuff down is really helpful and then we can measure how well we're doing. Um, we, a lot of us have these phones that measure how well we're sleeping. Any of you do that? And you look at your sleep score every morning and you think, I don't feel like I got 85 last night. <laughs> but, um, so how are you going to measure? How are you going to evaluate uh, how well you're doing? And then consistency. We've talked a little bit about consistency. Some, a lot of the laws we've done, intentionality and consistency and things, um, fall into this. Consistency is really about being realistic. So whatever you put in place is realistic and repeatable. I think that's a really good mantra in terms of if you're thinking about strategies and design, either for your life or for your church or your work, or your family, whatever. Is it realistic and is it repeatable? Am I going to be able to do this every day? So Couch to 5K is one of those examples, isn't it, of that app that you start off slowly and it just makes you do a little bit. If you want to run 5K, you're not going to get up one morning and just do it. So what are you putting in place that's realistic and repeatable? Um, you know, thinking maybe again about the sleep, like, I'm really addicted, you know, am I really addicted to my phone? And, I, you know, do I spend an hour before I go to bed doom scrolling through Instagram stuff or Facebook videos? What's realistic and repeatable? I need to make sure that this goes on sleep. You know, you can program them, can't you? So it shuts down, goes on sleep at, what, 9.30? Is it realistic? And is it repeatable. Don't do something too complicated. My day on Thursday was not too complicated. I didn't give myself hour by hour stuff to do. It's like I need to do these two studies, skeleton of them in the morning. I need to get the base work done for this talk in the afternoon. It was enough. Uh, I got that done. I wasn't then beating myself up because I'd not achieved unrealistic targets. Does that make sense? I'm sorry if you feel like you need to run out of the room because you're not a design person. <laughs> but honestly, try and look at how, what would it look like to do the John Maxwell and to go over your diary from the last year and really think about, I should have done more of that or I could have done less of that. And that'll feed into the law of trade-offs that we're going to do uh, in a minute. So uh, we've got uh, about 10 minutes for you to do this, and then we're going to have a break from 11 till quarter past. Uh, so Wakefield, I'll just talk through this, and then we'll say goodbye to you. And you can do this on your own on your tables and have your break. Uh, but have a think. Choose an area of your life where you desire to improve, or it might be an area of your life where you're experiencing a problem or a blockage, or it might be an area of your life where you're sensing there's an opportunity. So have a think. Is there an area of your life you want to improve? Is there an area where you're experiencing a problem or a blockage? Or one where you're sensing an opportunity? 
Let me go, how do I go back? That one that presumably has a back arrow. So once you've chosen an area, have a think about these things. So what's the big picture? What's the priority right now? What do I need to do to organize myself? How am I going to get going? How am I going to measure how well I'm doing? And how, just challenge yourself to think about, is this consistent? Am I going to be able to keep going with this? And how do I do that? Is that okay? Can you do that? I say it might be that you just want to talk about something, or you don't talk about it, do it yourself <laughs> with a piece of paper. might be sleep. Some of you might be struggling with sleep. Or it might be something bigger, like, do you know what? I think I want to retire in the next three years. <laughs> Choose which one you're going for. You know, it might be something really big. Or it might be something a bit more immediate and simple. Is that okay? Do you want me to put up the other things? So either a place to improve, a place where you've got a problem, a place where you're sensing an opportunity. And then I'll leave that slide up. Think, what's the big picture? Priorities, organize, action, measure, consistency. If you want to talk to people, you can, but I suggest you just have 10 minutes with a piece of paper and try and think through some of this stuff. Okay? Off you go. We'll come back together, we'll come back together at uh, quarter past 11. So do this piece of work um, and get your coffee in the, in the midst of it. Uh, at quarter past 11, we'll go to the next bit of input um, over from Wakefield.
Hello, hello, hello. I'm just going to carry on talking, dog, unless you tell. Please, everyone, just ignore me. We're having technical difficulties, so I'm just testing the microphone. And pretend I'm not here. Everything working? Okay, thank you. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so actually, I'm not, I'm not really bothered about. Well, so take a look at these ones, and then you can use this if you want. Okay. So, so, to so we've got the coffee timer up now. Yep. So I only need the first two. And I, need first two. I think so. Yeah. And the rest of them, are for per I'm leaving them in because it's it's things that people can look back after and say, okay, I want to go deep on trade-offs. This will guide you if you wanted to go deeper. Right. Well, you all might direct it because there's only me and Doug at the moment. So yeah, if you can use this, yeah. just press that and go onto the next slide. I'll put the coffee slide up there. Yeah. That's all you have to do. You'll be able to see what's on the screen on the screen in the back there. Yeah. If you press that, it'll go onto the next. Yeah. The next slide. And if you go to find me to go back, you just press up again. That's great. Thank okay. you. And um, thanks for the clock. It's really helpful. Yeah, that's what the, yeah. So good. <laughs> there you go. So good. Yeah. I like to finish as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, just plonk it up there. Yeah. 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 That was for us. I think it's yeah. a subtle hint to shorten my preaching, I think. <laughs>
we've got a minute before we go to transmit, haven't we? So I'll just have a quick. We've got about another minute before we're going to start the next session, which is on trade offs. How did you get on with your discussion about um, design? Do you manage to make a start? What Mandy and I were talking, one of the things that I think is important to say is that in a 20 minute period, it's, it's unlikely that you'll be able to get through all of that material. But what, what you have now got is a framework, and if you wanted to, you could go back through the video and you could listen to how Sharon has gone through using the sleep example, and she's gone through looking at that. And one of the things that Mandy said, and I think it's true, is that it is good to have an action bias, but at the same time, if we don't really get into, for example, what the obstacle is, then we can disappoint ourselves by taking action too early, tripping up, and then, as we discussed in the law of the mirror, we stop seeing value in ourselves. We just think, oh, I'm a failure. No, <laughs> no. So, sorry? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So we were just wrapping up on our um, <laughs> our design um, session, and I trust you had a good time here. There's lots of fruitful conversations going on here in Wakefield. Okay. So we're going to look now at the law of trade-offs. You have to give up to, uh, to, to grow up. But before we do that, I just um, I thought I'd make a little comment about some things that Sharon was saying earlier. If you're looking for somebody who's really, really organized, that's who Sharon is. Um, she's able to, to put together, as she said, detailed plans about what to do. Now, if Sharon's over there, I'm probably over there. I, I, I think if you were looking for um, an organized person who, who has a detailed plan for things, then don't look at me. Another thing I wanted to talk about just before we get into the law of trade-offs is you've probably noticed how both Andy and Sharon have referred back to other content in the course. So although Andy was setting the scene for design, he was referring back to the law of the environment. Although Sharon was talking about design, she referred back to the law of awareness. How we, if we know ourselves, we can grow ourselves. Sharon has obviously done a lot of, on, on self-awareness. She's aware about her own, um, who she is, how she operates, so she can incorporate that awareness into designing her own life. Does that make sense? So what I want to encourage you to do is, we, we've just got one more session after today, but we're really only scratching the surface. You're free to go back through the videos and to look again. In fact, what I would recommend is that you look at the possibility of repeating the course. Now, why do I say that? Well, I've had the blessing of being able to repeat this course for five years, actually a bit longer. Okay, that, and that's been a blessing to me. I would consider myself to be perhaps a bit of a slow learner. So you'll find me taking notes while Sharon and Andy are speaking. Why? Because I've got more to learn on these things. I'm not bored with them, even though, and I think I've said this before, what we're talking about is not rocket science. Personal growth and leadership, the sessions aren't rocket science. What we're actually doing is through John Maxwell's lens, if you like, is distilling, identifying, naming the principles that cause growth. So those principles come into our conscious mind. We're now conscious that actually the environment and changing my environment really can help me and help my church to grow. We're conscious that self-awareness, know yourself to grow yourself, really will affect the way that I learn because of who I am. Yeah? So each of these laws um, in, stand alone in their own right, but they are also interconnected. 
and we're not covering all of them. Okay? So I would really encourage, um, encourage you to, in this coming month perhaps, to reflect back over what we've been covering since session one and refresh yourself. Maximise the impact of the course through a bit of repetition. Okay, over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm hoping that we'll get a clear understanding of what trade-offs are. And because we're more aware, because we understand trade-offs, it comes into our conscious thinking that we can make trade-offs in our daily lives that will enable us to grow. John Maxwell um, talked about, uh, I think he said he's made 27 major trades in his life. I think last week he turned 76, by the way. And one of the things that he said that, that really struck with, stuck with me was, when you stop trading, really your growth is over. Now, um, Louise, who's sitting here now, um, she, she gave me some, some just, just talking to me about some of the things that have happened for her in her journey. And she said, Neville, um, each year I've tried something new. So one year into sessions, the next year flower arranging. Give me another one, Louise. Because I've forgotten. looking after children. So this idea of, of growing, experiencing new things, this sense of movement, um, and that's a, that's, a one, that's a wonderful picture of how we can try new things um, as well. So one of the things that Don Maxwell talks about, which is probably the biggest trade he made, was he changed, he, he gave up seven average marbles in order to get a super marble you know, really, really nice marble. And at five years old, that was a significant trade. Can you imagine the internal thoughts wrestling with a desire for this super marble and deciding whether four marbles for a swap is your limit or are you gonna go for more? And finally, making a decision and getting that treasured marble that you want. You have to give up average marbles, to go up to a super marble. In the video preparation, what I asked was, do you think of some successful trades that you've made in your life? And I hope that you were able to identify some, and I hope if you haven't already, that you will identify some by the end of our session today. I've got a Scottish neighbour, he left the armed forces some time ago and uh, moved in with his wife next door to us. Um, and you can imagine leaving the armed forces is quite a big change, isn't it? And he, he worked hard on a day job and then part-time he studied for an MBA, a Masters in Business Administration. And then he got a role in an air conditioning company and he rose up there to sales uh, manager. He got made redundant and he had to start again, and he did. He worked for a plumber's merchant where he got loads of experience and became a branch manager um, at that uh, organization. And from there, he became an academic tutor in a college. So you can see that he, he designed in and, and he was willing to trade along the way, trade time, he traded time that he could have put into other things to study for his MBA, and then he was willing to trade along the way. Some were forced trades, so the redundancy is forcing you to trade, and some were chosen trades, the last move he made into uh, the college where he is uh, teaching. I've actually heard a lot of stories, by the way, from, um, from people who have been made re redundant and how that became a catalyst for change. Doesn't always become a catalyst for change, does it? But it can be a catalyst for change. That's a forced trade. I've got a, a friend who became a vicar, this is some time ago, and 
after some years in his first post, he decided it was time to move on, but he felt, as did his wife, that, he, that they should take a step down, and he took an associate role in uh, another parish, a long way away um, from where he originally was. Why? Because he and his wife strongly believed that the trade down was what they needed to do. Because his wife had a picture of a big door and a little door at the bottom right-hand corner. And that they should go through the little door. And they went through the little door. And within three years, he found himself leading um, a very large parish. Unexpectedly, that's just how it worked out. And I've spoken to a number of people who've been willing to give up to go up. So they haven't necessarily understood why. They were just being obedient to God in what they did. And they found that that became the doorway to something that they hadn't asked for or imagined. When I came to um, Bradford um, many years ago, I came with two options in front of me. One was to accept a place at Bradford University and study engineering and management studies. And the other was to join a charity which is now known as Reach Beyond. I can't say that I was aware that I was making a trade and that I was choosing between different things. I didn't see it as a trade to move up from the south of England to the north, and neither did I see it as a, as a trade-off between the two options that were in front of me. And this is why awareness is important. So when we bring the subject of trade-offs, we now all have a level of understanding of what we mean. We can be more conscious, more intentional in the ways that we trade. We can be more considered. We can put the pluses and minuses, we can write them down, discuss them with friends for those major things that we want to change in our lives. So our awareness of trading means that we don't have to accept the status quo. I think one of the things that, that is designed into creation, as Andy and Sharon have referred to, is that creation is, all, is something that's always changing. There's myriad interactions going on. It's lively. There's life. The status quo, a stuck state, can often mean the opposite, can't it? It can be killing us because we haven't or won't make a trade or we believe we can't. In the video, I asked you to imagine watching just one hour less TV or spending just one hour less on social media per week. Let's say that saved 40 hours in a year. That's sufficient to have some great training in pastoral care or pastoral conversations. There was a, a wonderful pastoral conversations course that took place that Mandy led in Bradford, uh, I think last, over the last couple of weeks. And I've heard feedback from a person who was on that course I bumped into and how, how transformational that has been for them in their conversations. So just giving up to go up, giving up a bit of time to find out what courses could relate to the things that you would like to do, the things you would like to trade, can have a massive impact. They expand you, and then because they expand you, they allow you to contribute more. Our lives become more fulfilling. Jesus did say it's ble more blessed to give than to receive. And I don't mean, he didn't say there's more blessed to burn out, did he? He said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So trading, I'd really encourage you to, to, to sort of think through what it is perhaps that you need to put down so that you can pick up something else. So what holds us back? Well, for me, I think most of what holds me back, this is, I'm talking about me personally now, has been fear. Okay, I'm gonna be completely open about that. I think fear has been the biggest thing that's held me back. Fear of what? Fear of failure, fear of what others may think. Anybody identify with these? Fear of losing what's comfortable to pick up something that I don't know. 
And I take a bit of assurance that I'm not alone. And we can all take reassurance that we're not alone. Apparently, in the Bible, the phrase, do not be afraid, is written 365 times. Which I think is fantastic. One for every day of the year. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And one of my favourites is, do not be afraid. Why? Because I am with you. And with God with us, that's actually enough. We need to encourage one another in these things so that we can make those brave, those courageous decisions that we might just put off and put off and put off. From the story of the burning bush, we learn that Moses, he even doubted his own ability, his own value. He feared rejection by his own people. He even doubted his own speech. Moses, okay, Moses. But with the reassurance of God, the presence of God and the provision of God, he made a trade. So he put down what he was doing in the wilderness with the sheep and he picked up what God was asking him to do and that led a group of people out of slavery. God was patient with Moses and he's patient with us. Without doubt, trade-offs is a key to growth. Without conscious trading, we're waiting for circumstances to act on us. Do you wish that somebody would recognise a particular gift that you think you have or a calling that you think you had? Are you waiting for somebody to come up to you and say, hey, but you have agency. You have agency. You can go and talk to your vicar, your priest, your friend about the thing that's on your heart and mind. A lot of trades I've made have been unconscious, okay? So I want, I want you to know that. A lot of my trades have been unconscious. And that's okay. We can see that our unconscious trades can be redeemed by God, okay? So Moses, he didn't realise it, but his unconscious trade was to murder somebody and find himself in the wilderness. But God wraps all of that up, all of his experience with the rulers in Egypt growing up in the royal household, this time alone of reflection and being in a wilderness, he wraps all of that up into his purposes. And that's the God we serve. He can take our unconscious traits, even the ones we may have regretted, and wrap them up into his purposes. But there's more. What if we ask God to stir in us a desire for trades that are going to grow both us and our church? Maybe you have the gift of hospitality or listening or helps. I think somebody mentioned helps earlier. Mandy mentioned helps earlier. What trade could you make to enhance or use that gift more? Maybe a fear is holding you back from having a conversation with somebody else. Take courage. Have the conversation. Good trade-offs create movement. Change happens when we trade and growth happens. Okay, what we're going to do now... I hope you can read this, and if you can't, uh, maybe you want to go to full screen on that for, um, for, for the guys in Bradford. We're going to spend some time now, um, I think we've got about 20 minutes, 15 minutes, can't remember, um, but I will, I'm, I'm sure we can work that out, and you're going to have a handout. And the handout is a, is a story from the, from the Bradford newspaper called Telegraph and Argos. And it's about a judge, Jonathan Rose, who was in the Telegraph, I think, on, uh, on yesterday. And what I'd like you to do is to go through that sheet, that handout, and to underline anything that strikes you as you read his story of the, in relation to trade-offs that he made, whether conscious or unconscious. 
You can just scribble on this sheet. You can write, if it provokes something, a thought about um, another law, just write it down, make it yours, make that sheet yours. Then after that, the second thing then is to share what struck you most with the person next to you. Don't do it with each other because it'll take too long. Just with the person next to you. Then thirdly, after you've done that, quietly reflect on trade-offs that you have made personally. What trade-offs do you need to make in order to grow further in your God-given potential? What obstacles, what things are getting in the way? Then after you've done that, have a little bit of time, I'm hoping we'll get four or five minutes, just to pray in pairs for each other about the things that we're discovering. Okay, so we're going over to, to Bradford now to lead from there. And at the end of the session, you'll get a little handout of um, a, a poem, which um, is for you to take and have a read of, which I find very, very encouraging. In fact, I'll read it to you very quickly now. And then you can focus on that perhaps a little bit more when you're at home. It's called Making Good Choices After Bad Ones. Though no one can go back and make a brand new start, my friend, anyone can start from now and make a brand new ending. Thank you.
to Bradford, just spend a, just maybe pick out one thing that you've underlined that you think is the most important to you and then just share it and why, but very quickly. So just do that in three minutes now. five minutes why don't we just pray for each other God knows what's on our hearts in terms of trade-offs doesn't he um, that the trade-offs that we need to make in order to move towards our potential to be able to contribute more uh, to be able to to be to be all that God has intended us to be let's pray for each other just just in, in your groups now that those things will be identified and released over the coming weeks months and years. Okay.
I believe the encouragement was to pray, so in a minute I'm just going to say amen, and whatever prayer you didn't say um, that was in the conversation, we'll get to an end of it, okay? Amen. All those prayers. Amen. So we thought this, this morning about these two laws of uh, design and, and trade-offs. And uh, what I want to do now is just to help think about how we're going to spend the rest of this morning and what we'd like you to do between now and when we meet in March and what we'll do in that session uh, in March. So when uh, we were thinking about the law of design earlier, we were asking you to apply that particularly to your own life. What we'd like you to be doing from here on is thinking about how you do apply that to your church's life. Um, so in the same way as we thought about in our own lives, what, is, what might it be that God might want us to focus on, uh, which might be something we want to improve or get past a blockage, um, or there's a particular opportunity we want to take hold of. Same thing for our church life. Is there something in our church life which is an opportunity for us that we want to take hold of? 
Um, I'm not going to lead the witness, but I'm going to say to those of us in Bradford, there is a city of culture thing next year. That's an opportunity. Now, there might be other big opportunities in front of you, but that's one of them which is there for us um, here in Bradford. There might be some blockage or, um, or problem or just you, you, after the conversations that you've had over these past months, I know Fountains, you've done a survey. There's an area, areas to improve out of that survey. That might be a thing that you want to take hold of. So we'd like you in your groups to think about that together. And then to start to think about what might the design look like. In the same way as Sharon invites us to do that for our own lives, what is it? when we apply it to our church life. What's the big picture? What are the priorities? How can we organize? What action is going to happen? In the same way as God looks and reviews, how we measure how we're doing and how we keep going at it consistently. So those same principles we've used looking at our own lives, how we apply those into our church lives. So therefore, a question which might get us into that is, in light of the course, where are we going as a group, we've done the course together, or as a church in the next year? What's the plan? I say this stuff we've been inviting you to be thinking into um, over these past months, so this shouldn't be entirely new, but that's what we'd like you to be doing. And I'd like you to start thinking about that and con I'll continue in the conversation uh, in the next few minutes before we finish today. But when we come back next time for our final session together, what we want you to do is to bring, however you want to do that, that might be a great big piece of flip chart. That might be a detailed 20-page action plan. No, possibly not. Um, or it, whatever. Bring something, which is then you can explain to a buddy church what are your plans what will they achieve? And how might we mess it all up? How can we make sure that we don't do it? What might sabotage that? So three things. Your plans, what will they achieve? How, will they, how can we sabotage it? Now, as you'll be in a buddy pair group, you'll be listening to another church and their thoughts. So as you listen to them next time, these are the questions we're going to have for you who are the church that are listening to another church's plans. What excites you about them? Because there's nothing like mutual enthusiasm. That's really good. In fact, you may want to then go back and revise your own plans in the light of what you heard that they're going to do. Do you have any thoughts or advice for them? And then we're going to ask you to pray for the buddy church. Is that clear? Yes, Andy, that's clear. So I'm just going to put um, that, that slide back up because what we're going to do now, uh, between now and when we kind of just finish up with, with some prayer at the end, is to, wherever you've got to so far in that process, to, is to spend some time continuing it. Um, I know that Silsden are mostly at... Um, Scargill at the moment, so Greg, you are the one working on this on your own. Sorry about that. Um, but you can start the thinking process and work out what it is you're going to take back to them. So start that process now, and um, in a little while, um, Sharon or I will come back up and we will conclude this morning. So also as part of this, I'm obviously make sure that you know when you're meeting as a group between now and the March meeting, uh, and be ready to come and bring your plans um, to share with another group when we come back then. Is that all right? Off you go.
you just begin to uh, draw your conversations to a close? Oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> You've obviously finished talking. Um, Angie, have you got the prodder? There we go. So just to uh, recap, so you're really clear about what's happening uh, when you meet up. You've already started to talk about it, but when... So, how did you find that? You find we, we were saying on, on uh, the group here that because this is a process, you may already have a design in place. So, what this is an opportunity to do is to kind of press down on that. Maybe maybe some tweaks and things. If you know, you might have had new understanding. You think, well, actually, work a bit more on that. It's fine, but it gives you a new framework to look at design. So, we, on, on the table here with um, Tim and crew, that happened very naturally. So, if, if we look at choose an area where you want a, have a desire to improve, experience a problem or blockage, sense an opportunity. Do you want to talk about the opportunity for... Yeah? Would you like to do that, um, Gary? Do you want to talk about that? So going through that sequence there, desire to improve, blockage, opportunity. Uh, yes, at, uh, at St. John's congregation, an elderly congregation, and I've not been going to St. John's, but I have got nine grandchildren, <laughs> ranging from five to 20. And one other thing I've noticed as some of them have come has been that there's the space that was the children's space has been eaten up with other things, perfectly valuable things. But if we want to open up the church, anybody coming with children and baptism groups, etc., so that they want to come back, we've got a blockage. But we've also got a big opportunity. Okay, so you wanted to do is to improve what we. So that your provision for children was better. The blockage was the space you were previously used. was to engage children. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in that discussion, solu yeah. solutions yeah. to the blockage. Sorry. Yeah. In that discussion, solutions to the blockage were identified. Okay, so that was a positive sort of five minute discussion and the, you know, there's a solution orientation here. So um, there were a couple of obstacles were identified and both there were options for resolving them. Anybody else want to just briefly say what you found? Uh, well, we've been um, talking about how we want to engage with the wider community more. Um, we've not got a massive congregation, um, and we do obviously want to grow that, but, um, you know, it's, it's not, not the easiest thing, so we've been looking at ways we can do that. And um, we've, we sense an opportunity with, obviously, the, project, the Give to Go Green project we've got at the moment. We've had two, two events so far, which have both been really successful and um, brought a lot of new people in to the church. And um, obviously, we've got a few more events to go, so that's as focused at the moment in terms of fundraising and engaging with people. But then we want to sit back after and maybe look at how we can give back to the community for supporting us. So maybe looking at coffee mornings for different charities that you know are important to people, and going out and asking the community, you know, how we can help them. So, you know, is is you know is the small community groups that we can do um, fundraising for at coffee mornings, or is the key charities that people 
would like us to fundraise for just an opportunity to give back and just to remind people that we are there and that we're there to help you know we've we've asked a lot of the community over the last few weeks you know to support us with our events and we want to give back i really love that reciprocal relationship building you know where um how's the dogs thing going The dog show was a massive success. <laughs> it, it, it was, wasn't it? We're still talking about it. Yeah. We it's went, we went shops and that at the end of the week. Yeah. yeah. We, I think we might have a pet blessing service. Yeah. Point. I think Margaret said so. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it, it was, it, it, it just grew and grew. It was a bit scary at the beginning of the day. Cause <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's great. I'd love to have some time to hear more about that because I was really excited when I heard about the... Um, this initiative, and I wondered if it might lead to some kind of pet blessing. It reminded me of something that I just came across a couple of months back. There's a church on the Isle of Man, and they did something called a dog tivity. <laughs> I know they say, was it, don't, don't work with children and animals. They did both. And um, they, they, they'd got a professional trainer to help them, and they basically had the characters were dogs. And it, it was so, it attracts so many people from the community because a lot of people have dogs, don't they? So, you know, this is, this is great, this relational two-way giving and receiving, very natural environments that you're creating. That's, that's wonderful. Anything you'd like, I'd like to say? I'll try. Um, St. Catherine's and St. Andrew's, but we're not... St. Catharines now, officially. Um, we've got this vision and ministry uh, priorities for 2023 to 2026. And um, both of the churches now have become one. Uh, we're on the similar lines. Um, ordinary people growing together and serving our world in love of Jesus and sharing God's love, supporting each other because of God's love, serving the world in the power of God's love. And that's some of the statements. And we've got priorities. Um, Christ-centered is worship. Um, priority two is hope and for children's children and we've got a children's worker, youth worker now. Uh, renewing evangelism, renewing lives evangelism, uh, inspired discipleship, uh, disciples discipleship, and serving others, service, and together, community. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, this is... This is really interesting. I've actually got, um, I don't know if I've got it here, but uh, you guys have done something similar, haven't you, at, um, at yours? Where's it gone? Here we go. Oh, this was about stewardship. This one was specifically about stewardship. What, I, what I'm wondering is, next time, how about you all bring along things that are specific to each of your churches? Have a swap around. It's great cross-fertilization, it catalyzes different ideas. You don't have to take them on board, do you? But it's great, it's refreshing to see what other people do. And it's great that what I'm seeing here is focus, okay? So there's a definite sense of focus in catalyzing engagement in the church as a whole through this, where people get an opportunity to respond about stewardship, not just in terms of money, but in um, roles people might like to consider within the church. Okay, so that's a, that's a lovely thing. Th this is incredibly clear, and once you've stated something, it gives you almost like a plumb line, doesn't it? You can start to say, oh, well, how important is this really in relation to what we've already prayed about and discussed and agreed that we need to be focused on over these next three years and the order of priority that we've set? It gives you a really good guide as to what to say no to so that you can give your bigger yes to the things that count. So it, it just is so encouraging to hear what's going on here. Your, to me, your heart emphasis seems to be 
let's relate to our community better. That's, that's what I'm hearing. Let's be the church with the open door where people want to come in, where we're relating in ways that make sense. Okay, so I'm finding this really, really encouraging. I'm hoping that as you, you'll, you'll get the slides, by the way, so that when you meet, you can just refer back to those um, and uh, you're not expected to do something new. If, if what you're already doing is what you're doing, give it as an opportunity to express it more succinctly, more um, in a way that you can explain it to each other, because that's what's going to happen next time, is you're going to get the opportunity to explain it to somebody else, like a, a call it a, you're almost a friendly, a friendly listener, who's just going to listen and give you some feedback, and that can be a really helpful experience. It gives you a chance to articulate it in a way that makes sense, to speak about it in a way that makes sense to somebody else. So I'm very excited to hear what's going to happen um, next time. Okay, um, we're at half past twelve. Um, Catherine, would you mind, would you mind, please, just um, praying, praying for us all? Thank you. Let's just hold a moment of quiet while we just reflect on what we've heard, maybe what we've said. You for this meet with you and one another. Father, we pray that you will bless us as we go from this place. Lord, keep us thinking, keep us praying. Keep us you. And Lord, we pray that as you bless us, you will enable us to be a blessing to others, to those in our communities, to those in our families, to those strangers we might meet along the way. Be with us by the power we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Great, everybody, and thank you so much for your engagement today. It's been brilliant.